Good afternoon and welcome to the Ford Presidential Museum. My name is Elaine Didier and it's my privilege to serve as director of the museum here in Grand Rapids and the library in Ann Arbor. We are delighted that you could be with us today and also that spring seems to have finally come to West Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have a round. a round of applause for spring. The Ford Museum and the Ford Foundation appreciate the opportunity to co-host programs with various organizations, companies, and universities in Grand Rapids. This afternoon, we are especially pleased to be partnering with Spectrum Health to present an important discussion about women's health issues as a part of our recognition of Betty Ford's 96th birthday today. Showing how relevant this subject is, I can share from the annals of the Ford Library that just last week we had an urgent inquiry from the NBC Nightly News because no, someone other, no other than Brian Williams was covering it. And the question we were just discussing backstage was whether we had information about Mrs. Ford having had a mammogram. She went in for a physical exam and a couple of days later had a total mastectomy, but it's interesting that mammograms were in their infancy at that time, and so the chances are good that she did not have one, but certainly we verified from our records nothing to deal with that issue um, is, is in. So it's an interesting case where you've got the media covering the story, which is good, and I thought, of course, it had, was leading to today's program, but it was Brian Williams doing this on his own. Before we begin, I'd like to ask a matter of housekeeping courtesy. Would you make sure your cell phones are turned off? And as a prelude to the program, I'd like to share some of our upcoming programs before we get to our speakers. We have another event honoring Betty Ford that will be at the library in Ann Arbor on April 24th, a Thursday. We have historian Elida Black discussing First Ladies in a talk entitled, Outspoken Women, What Eleanor Roosevelt and Betty Ford Taught Us About Leadership. Uh, Elida is a very dynamic speaker, and if you can get over to Ann Arbor that day, I, I encourage you to come. Here at the museum, we'll be dealing with World War II with a couple of programs on the 13th in partnership with the Howenstein Center, led by Cleves Whitney at Grand Valley. We're featuring Rick Atkinson. Uh, he has just published the third volume of his Liberation Trilogy, The Guns at Last Light, The War in Western Europe, 1944 and 45. Uh, he is a dynamic speaker. Howenstein Center has hosted him in the past, and we're thrilled to have him coming back. And that program will be across the street at the Howenstein, or at uh, at the Pew campus of Grand Valley. Coming up in June, it is the 70th anniversary of D-Day, amazingly, and the museum will be hosting an, uh, the 70th anniversary reunion of the 501st Airborne, uh, who were airdropped in. And uh, before that, on the 4th, we have John McManus speaking about the dead and those about to die, D-Day, the big red one at Omaha Beach. That will be a very interesting program. And then looking forward to July, it will be President Ford's 101st birthday. We will have the traditional wreath laying, and we will be opening a new feature exhibit called Taking the Seas, the Rise of the American Carrier. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with the Navy, and uh, both regarding historic aircraft carriers and their role, but also the new USS Gerald R. Ford, which is in construction. And there will be a luncheon address across the river by Secretary James Baker. So all of these are in the works. And then coming up in August, we start something very special. This, you may have seen the logo on the, on the podium across the river at the luncheon. Uh, it says 40th. This August 9th is the 40th anniversary of the beginning of the Ford presidency. He was sworn in on August 9th. So from thence, we com commence two and a half years of recognitions and tributes for challenges and accomplishments during the Ford administration. So there will be a series of retrospective panels and speakers and so on. So keep an eye out for information on, on those programs. Now to our program. It is my pleasure to introduce Gleaves Whitney, who is the director of the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley, who has been invited by the Ford Foundation to introduce our distinguished panel of speakers and to moderate the program. And so with that, Gleaves, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Elaine, and thanks for your attendance today on this very important topic. We are very proud to partner with Elaine and the Ford and with these fine uh, panelists as well and bring the level of awareness about breast cancer uh, to a greater level and also um, uh, just generally appreciate who Betty Ford was since this is her birthday. So I'd like to uh, start, since my role as an historian is to help put this uh, talk a little bit into context, Betty Ford's time in the White House. 
Uh, if you go back to 1974 and you look at the, what the most popular hit was that year, it's appropriate. It was Barbra Streisand's The Way We Were, Memories. So I couldn't have th thought of a better uh, way to introduce this talk. But if you go back 40 years ago and look at what the costs of some of the things were back then, let's just take a look at those. Postage stamp, eight cents. Gallon of gas, 53 cents. You could get a new car for about $3,000 and you get yourself into a nice tri-level home for about $35,000. Men, you men, you could buy a white polyester sports suit for $85, remember those? Uh, ladies, you could take home a fashionable bell bottoms or flares set for uh, under $30. And all these ways show how different that the, the era was. And one way it is really significantly different is that in 1974, prominent women, women in prominent social positions, were still living in a rather Victorian world, and they were not allowed to broach socially sensitive topics. Well, that brings us to Betty Ford, because although she may have been born in a Victorian era, she was by no means Victorian. She was willing to break the mold when it came to speaking. She was as outspoken as her husband was plain-spoken. Already in the mid-1970s, she was a pro-choice Republican. She was the first First Lady to champion a feminist agenda. She was the first First Lady who was not reluctant to disagree with her husband in public. And to Jerry Ford's credit, that showed really how secure he was that she could do so. Uh, she was also the first First Lady to give the American people a view into her private life. Now, I liken, I was talking to President Tom Haas before this event began. I, I liken what the Fords became in the White House very much to what the Adams family was, our second president. Because with the, with the Fords and the Adams, you have a tremendous insight both into their public achievements, their public record, but also their private lives. Because the Adamses wrote something like 1,700 letters to each other. So we know what their domestic concerns were as well. Not since the Adams had a presidency opened up so much and given us such a great view of what life inside the White House was going to be like. So she's really to be commended for that. And of course, let me hasten to add, when Betty Ford opened up her life a little bit to us, it wasn't out of narcissism, but it was out of the desire to give other people hope because she realized she had an important platform. She really did find her voice during these important years. And with that platform, she could save millions of lives. And it surprised her, in fact, how powerful that platform was. Also, when you think back in 1974, uh, Elaine just alluded to a big event that happened. Um, it was after Watergate, and the American people were sick and tired of the dirty little secrets, the tricks, the, the criminality, frankly, that had occurred in Washington. And the Fords had not sought the, the White House, and it was Richard Nixon's resignation and the provisions of the 25th Amendment that would put them there. This gives the Fords a marvelous opportunity to set a new tone in the White House and in politics in general in this country. And Betty Ford would rise to the occasion as well, because for those of you who have seen the film uh, at the luncheon, it was clear that Betty Ford um, uh, knew that something was amiss uh, within about a month. Uh, one of the panelists will speak to this in just a moment, but within about a month of when uh, President Ford became president. Well, when you look at the, the decision that that family made to start a new era in American politics, where there would be candor and transparency, and you look at, at what happened during the fall of 1974, while President Ford is trying to deal with all this inflation, all these other problems, foremost in his mind is her health. And it's why you see, for example, him sort of choking up at an economic summit when he gets to announce that his wife came through the surgery strong. It's why you see photographs, the striking photographs of him at her bedside uh, when she's in recovery. It's why you see interviews, uh, Newsweek magazine, uh, Morley Safer is going to get in on the act, Barbara Walters and other prominent interviewers are going to talk to Betty Ford and she's going to speak with candor to them about her experience and use her experience as a platform uh, for awareness. There are many, many testimonies of the women who have been saved by Betty Ford's candor and transparency. 
our, our mothers, our sisters, our daughters can all, um, I think, be very grateful. And certainly we men are grateful to her as well for all of this. While the goal of her husband's administration was to heal a nation in the civic sphere, Betty's goal was to heal the women in both the family and public spheres who had been suffering under a shroud of silence. Thanks to Betty Ford, breast cancer is not the silent killer it once was, and she's made all the difference to the women we love in our lives. As Rosalind Carter very eloquently put it, she said, Betty was never afraid to speak the truth, even about the most sensitive subjects, including her own struggles with alcohol and painkillers. Millions of women are in her debt today. So that's, that concludes my opening remarks uh, for this panel. What I'd like to do now is I have the honor of introducing my two colleagues to uh, my right. Uh, first who's going to speak will be Judy Smith, who's the chief of Spectrum Health Cancer Center. And she's going to speak on achievements in women's health over the past 40 years. And after she speaks, and Tom Getz, Medical Director, Betty Ford Breast Care Services at Spectrum Health, will be speaking on the legacy of Betty Ford's firsts, achievements in breast cancer care here in Grand Rapids at her namesake Breast Cancer Center. Uh, please, Judy. Thank you. Um, I have a lot to personally be thankful for um, Betty, to Betty Ford. I just want to tell you a little story. I'm a surgical oncologist, a cancer surgeon, and I was in school when Betty Ford was diagnosed with breast cancer and uh, was working my way through. But by the time I hit the surgical residency interview process, this is what the interview looked like. Boy, your grades are great, your credentials are great, but why should we let a woman in the program, mm -hmm. right? Are you gonna get pregnant? Is it worth our time? And they, they asked these questions. Are you gonna get pregnant? I said, don't plan on it. Um, are you gonna work full time when you're done? And I said, well, I plan on it. And uh, interestingly enough, it's because of Betty Ford and women like her that I'm now sitting here because a lot has changed since those years. Those questions aren't even appropriate, nor um, should they ever have been. But uh, I was a, a fencer, a national f championship fencer, and I said if I can, if I can beat it pretty much anybody with a sword, I probably can, can succeed in this program. So uh, they let me in and the rest is history. <laughs> but a lot has changed. A lot have changed in medicine, especially in cancer care over the past 40 years. Um, the survival of all patients with cancer in the early 70s was about 50%. Depending on your ethnicity, depending on your stage, really somewhere between 50 and maybe 68% if you were a white, upper class individual with cancer um, who had the very best in health care. And now today, about um, two thirds survive cancer. So we go from about 50% to about 75%, and that's for all cancers. And that's, that's just a massive change. Uh, you know, beginning, beginning when we really started the focus on cancer research and care and really started to advance um, the cancer kind of mission, um, particularly, you know, with the help of the NCI and the cancer centers, we really didn't impact the mor morbidity, the death rate, until the 90s. It took us several decades um, to start to impact the death rate. And finally, it began to decline in the 90s, and we've seen a 20% decrease in the death rate from all cancers since the 90s. This is massive, it's significant, and it's, again, saved, saved all of our friends, many of our friends and family. Um, breast cancer alone has even more remarkable um, outcomes. Because of what Betty Ford did in part, as well as the advances in healthcare, the survival again in the 70s was at 50%, maybe 60% in the early 70s. By 70, 1975, it was about 75% for all patients. Today, 90% of all women or men diagnosed with breast cancer survive five years, 90%. And if it's caught early, 98.6% for early stage disease. Even now for regional disease, 88%. And this is, this is massive. Just, and it's really thanks to Betty Ford bringing it into the open, 
that really brought all of us to put pressure on each other in the medical field and the government to support cancer care research and advances in care. And their, their question really um, is not just the advances in screening with mammography, but also we have seen significant advances in treatment. Surgery. My first operation I did as a surgical trainee was a radical mastectomy. So if we remember what that is, you take pretty much everything from here to here, strip it down to the bone. There was no reconstruction. It was horribly disfiguring. And it didn't really work all that much better or than a no treatment often or clearly not better than what we do today. Since then, we've moved to modified radical mastectomy. We now have the tools to do breast preservation or breast sparing surgery with equally favorable outcomes. We've moved from having to do lymphadenectomies and removing all the lymph nodes under the arms to being able to do sentinel nodes where you can take one targeted lymph node and identify the risk of the individual. We've done plastic surgery. You know, we used to have the old silicone gel implants and that was pretty much it. They would leak and cause horrible toxicity. The FDA then started to regulate and we've improved in terms of the implants. We now do microvascular surgery tram flaps, free flaps, all the different types of flaps. So we also now can do amazing reconstructive surgery. So we've gone from extremely disfiguring morbid surgery to really quite beautiful results when you have to have a mastectomy or when it's the best option for you with breast cancer. We also are now able to identify risk. We have a much more mature knowledge of family cancer syndromes we now have molecular genetic testing, and we genetic testing and targeting BRCA1, BRCA2, and we're able to clearly identify risk. So we know before there's even, even a hint of cancer for these individuals that the risk of the cancer, depending on their family and the genetics, is somewhere between 40 and 80% of getting cancer, and we can do prophylactic therapies. We've advanced in prophylactic therapies with the identification of how hormonal therapies can impact, impact the development of cancer as well as survival. We now have ER and PR um, um, indicators, so to speak, and we're able to use then drugs against that, not just one, tamoxifen, which is used both adjuvant or in concert with other therapies for breast cancer, but also now we know that we can use it for prophylaxis or in high-risk patients. It, it's and then, of course, the drug companies jump on that, and we have multiple others with, you know, less side effects and better, better um, tolerance for many women. The radiation's gotten better. So when I started, the most common thing you saw after radiation therapy was bright, red, burned skin. And for those of you in the medical field that are old enough, you'll remember that those days. It was really horrible, but radiation has come a long way. So we have better radiation. Now we don't have to radiate as much. We don't have the toxic side effects. We can do focal or limited radiation therapy, all of which leads to equivalent or better outcomes. And we've done hundreds of clinical trials to identify what combination of each of these therapies works. And we have better chemotherapy as well. Again, everybody knows, you know, now triple positive, triple negative, these things are just fall, you know, roll off your lips if you're familiar with breast cancer. None of this was in 1974. So we have now HER2 identification for risk, and we can do personalized therapies so we can identify what is best for an individual based on the individual characteristics of either their family history or their personal history, um, or in fact, what their tumor looks like under a microscope and under a uh, genetic analysis. So we have Herceptin. All of these things, as well as the combination and what we've done, have led to this remarkable, remarkable improvement in survival and, um, and for breast cancer. And then for those of you who have gone through it, think of how much better we've done for the side effects of the care as well. We used to have maybe Benadryl and Compassine. And now we have these amazing types of medications that can help diminish the side effects of chemotherapy and, and also 
we know how to treat lymphedema, which was a massive problem for years and a very, still a very significant issue for many women and men who undergo breast cancer treatment. All of this is due in part, and I feel in great part, to Betty Ford and what she did, standing up for women, giving us a voice, and standing up for transparency, and beginning, really, the fight for early diagnosis screening and subsequently then better treatment for breast cancer. So I thank Betty Ford, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Getz. Thanks, Judy. <clears throat> Um, as you've heard earlier, in, in 1974, just weeks after becoming First Lady, Betty Ford was actually accompanying a friend of hers who was going in for a breast exam. And her friend encouraged Mrs. Ford to have a breast exam, too. Uh, the doctor found a marble-sized lump in her right breast, and two days later, uh, she had her mastectomy for breast cancer. Instead of following what was then the traditional uh, path of uh, keeping everything quiet and downplaying her diagnosis or releasing a vague statement about having a woman's disease, she stepped into the spotlight and broke the taboo about talking about cancer in general, but especially about breast cancer. And uh, then was very instrumental in encouraging other women to um, get breast exams and seek early detection with mammography. In 1987, when a new breast imaging center was going to open at what was then Blodgett Hospital, Marianne Steckety, who was a Blodgett uh, Hospital Guild member and a friend of Mrs. Ford's, uh, approached her about naming the center in her honor. And the Betty, what was then known as the Betty Ford Center for Prevention and Screening was born with Mrs. Ford attending the dedication in September of 1987. Over the past 27 years, uh, this has expanded, expanded into Betty Ford Breast Care Services, now with a diagnostic center, seven additional screening sites, and a mobile mammography van in the Grand Rapids area, as well as affiliated sites at Reed City, Gerber, Kelsey, United Memorial, and soon Zealand Hospital. We take continuing Betty Ford's legacy of leading the way in promoting early detection and offering the best possible breast care experience seriously and have been able to bring a number of firsts to the women of West Michigan over those past 27 years. Um, in 1987, the Breast Center was the first to include, include nurse navigators in uh, the Grand Rapids area. And one of our nurse navigators is here today in the audience I saw her just a minute ago. These are specially trained nurses who help steer patients through the sometimes confusing process of breast cancer diagnosis and treatment. In 2002, we were the first to introduce computer-aided detection with mammography, which is a computer overread of the mammogram, which then directs the radiologist to take a second look at certain areas of the film. And this can decrease, uh, decrease uh, the miss rate of early cancers and can cause you to be able to pick up up to 20% more early uh, breast cancers. In 2004, we performed the first MRI-guided breast biopsy in West Michigan. Um, some cancers are only seen on MR, and so we need to find a way to uh, target and biopsy those. In 2006, the uh, center was the first to uh, introduce digital mammography in Grand Rapids. Digital mammography has been a huge breakthrough. It gives us both higher resolution images and cuts the radiation dose of mammography significantly. It has a 14 to 27 percent higher accuracy rate at finding small early breast cancers, especially in women under 50 and women with dense breasts. In 2009, it was the first site in Grand Rapids to be named a Breast Imaging Center of Excellence, a designation by the American um, College of Radiology. And this requires oversight and national accreditation in all parts of breast imaging, mammography, breast ultrasound, and breast MRI, as well as all three of the imaging-guided uh, biopsy procedures for um, uh, breast biopsy, stereotactic biopsy, ultrasound, and MRI-guided. Um, less than 5% of breast cancers in the, in the country uh, achieved that designation. In 2010, uh, the program was the first in West Michigan to be accredited, accredited by the National Accreditation Program for Breast Centers, or NAPBC, which is a consortium of 20 national medical organizations, including surgeons, radiologists, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and pathologists, who are all concerned with improving the quality of care and monitoring the outcomes of breast cancer patients. 
In 2011, uh, we were the first provider in the state of Michigan to offer digital breast homocystis, or 3D mammography, uh, which has been shown to find up to 40% more invasive breast cancers than digital mammography alone, and at the same time, is able to reduce the number of patients who have screening mammograms that we need to call back for diagnostic workups by 30 to 60%. And it can also be an important tool as part of a diagnostic workup. And most recently, in 2012, we were the first in the state of Michigan to offer radioactive seed localization for um, uh, breast surgery, which allows more flexible surgical scheduling and can help um, make a, a better surgical day for the patient. So it can be a shorter day for them on what's already a, a stressful, challenging time. It allows the surgeon to approach the lesion from the best possible direction to minimize scarring and to uh, preserve tissues that are needed for reconstruction surgery. And it allows the surgeon to more precisely remove the target so that they can take up to 24% less tissue and still be sure that they're getting all the tumor so that the number of times that they have to go back for additional surgery because the positive margins can be cut by up to 50%. So these have been exciting times the past 27 years since the, the center started. Exciting times in breast imaging and intervention. Uh, I bet that probably 70% of what we do today on a routine basis hadn't even been developed yet when I finished my radiology residency back in 1987. It's an exciting also to look forward to what the future has to bring with a lot of things on the horizon. And with that, I'll turn things over to Gleaves Whitney, who will be moderating the question part of the, of the program. Well, thank you both, Dr. Smith, Dr. Getz, for your very insightful comments. I invite the audience to, I think everybody received a piece of paper, and you can write a question. And we've got two people on each aisle who will be able to take your question, bring it up. So I invite you to pose questions for our distinguished panelists. And uh, I guess while we're waiting for that first question to come up from the audience, I have a question for you. As an historian, I'm just interested. Uh, and, and you both just, I think, took us through like a medical school seminar. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm interested sort of, a, a, again, to get back to the human angle of this, how many women got regular mammograms before Betty Ford went public about her breast cancer to how many women now get the regular examinations that can detect this? And, you know, what were some of the issues, especially I'm, I'm sure that it breaks down so some populations in this country hardly got any exams. Today, screening is still underutilized. And depending on, again, where, you, where you're located and your ethnicity and your access to health care, the range is somewhere between 60 and probably 70 to 75 percent of women that need to have mammograms get mammograms. In 1974, less than 5 percent. No question. And don't forget, because again, I spent a large part of my life doing GI, colonoscopy is even worse. And colonoscopy can cure the cancer before you get it. So if you're 50, get your colonoscopy because it's less than 50%, and even worse, again, depending on uh, where you're located and your access to health care. Um, mammography's not been around all that long compared to radiology in general. The first mammogram on a, on a real live patient was in 1930. Um, the first dedicated mammogram machine was in 1965. So between 1930 and 1965, they'd take mammograms on regular x-ray machines like they use for chest x-rays or, or, or leg films. Um, the first uh, dedicated film screen combination that could be used for high definition mammography with lower dose and didn't have to be developed in a, in a dip tank was 1970, uh, 1970. So when Mrs. Ford was diagnosed, that was still kind of the early days of modern mammography. Um, as Dr. Smith mentioned, back then hardly anybody was getting mammograms. And thanks to uh, Betty Ford's uh, getting the word out and raising awareness by uh, 1987, about 28% 20, uh, of women, so just over a quarter of women were getting mammograms. And as you heard, now we're up to about about 70%. It's impressive. It looks like we have some questions from the audience. I do, I do have a question. Um, what is your opinion on women like Angelina Jolie who have double mastectomy as a preventive measure? So I think that the uh, treatment based on your risk and the treatment for cancer is a personal choice. And I believe that it is, it is very much um, between you, your family, 
and the physician as to what choice you individually make in terms of both the diagnosis and treatment. And always remember that no treatment is sometimes uh, the right alternative depending on, on the patient. So I believe that that was what she could do in order to um, live in peace and that it was, again, her personal choice, a very appropriate personal choice in terms of medical therapy, uh, appropriate option, yet it's not the right answer for everyone, um, and I think that, that we just have to put that in context of, of uh, um, her, her self-image and her ability to make that choice um, individually. Correct medical decision, um, but it is a personal decision. Okay, another question. Um, so we're talking a lot about the need for regular mammograms. Um, there's one question here, what is the right frequency of mammograms for a woman over age 50? Another question that I'm seeing um, speaks to, um, is there a difference for women of different ethnicities? Uh, the best screening rate, um, uh, recommended by most medical organizations that actually take care of breast cancer patients is uh, starting at age 40 uh, a mammogram every year. Um, a lot of confusion was caused by the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force um, when they released their recommendation saying maybe don't start till, till 50 and then uh, maybe every one or two years. Um, there, were, there was nobody on the task force that actually takes care of breast cancer patients, um, which is unfortunate. Um, and, but, but all the major medical organizations, the American uh, um, Cancer Society, American College of Surgeons, American College of Radiologists, um, all, all recommend um, starting mammograms at, at age, uh, age 40 and then having them every year. If you have them less often, it just means that those cancers that start soon after the last mammogram have a chance to, to grow longer before they're, they're detected. So um, the, there's, the interval cancers are uh, likely to be to be larger. I just want to put that in perspective. Remember that we have now achieved a 98.6 cure rate or five-year survival with early stage cancers. Um, I think over the next five years and probably ten years we'll have a constant debate on resource utilization and allocation and this debate about whether it's 40 or 50 and one year or two years and if you're low risk and we're continuing to work on looking at genetic characteristics and to like personalized medicine but until the debate is ended at which time all of the societies will change their recommendations we have to remember the recommendations are there because we've gone from you know half of people dying of cancer to two-thirds and to the current state of 98.6% cure rate. So I think, uh, you know, this, these debates have gone on in medicine for years. Um, it's usually not been quite as public, um, but it's confusing. Until we get finished with the debate based on good science, uh, we stick with the recommendations. And, is that fair? Absolutely. Yeah, they, part of the debate has been are we treating some cancers that would not go on to, to become uh, invasive cancers and, and cause serious mor morbidities uh, and mortality? And, and, and that's probably true. We probably are. But we know that invasive breast cancer starts as ductal carcinoma in situ, and some of those will grow into invasive cancers and some aren't. Science isn't good enough to let us know which will go on and which won't. So, yet. Uh, yet, exactly. So at this point, um, you can't just say, oh, well, let's just hope this one never, never grows, and if it does, it's like, oh, well. <laughs> so it's, uh, that's why we, we treat them all aggressively at this point. And I've, I've been reading other audience questions, so I may have missed this, but is there any difference in mammogram recommendations for women of different ethnicities, or is the recommendation once a year for every woman starting age 40, regardless of ethnicity? Uh, yeah, yes, it's starting uh, at age 40 for every woman, regardless of ethnicity. And then earlier than age 40, if you have higher risk? If, if someone has a very uh, high family risk profile, then we recommend starting 10 years earlier. Okay. And completely different if you actually have BRCA1, BRCA2. Correct. Right. Okay. And uh, actually, yeah, BRAC, BRCA1, we tend to start earlier. BRCA2, we tend to not start earlier. Um, the people with BRCA2 tend to develop breast cancer later in life, and they're more radiosensitive. So by starting their mammograms earlier, 
you could actually be causing causing some harm. Now I know what BRCA1 and BRCA2 are, but I don't know if everybody in the audience does. So they're just genetic markers of risk for breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And we have, you know, developed many different genetic markers across the different cancer spectrum, but those are the two best known for breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And, you know, back before there was BRCA2, there was only BRCA. So, you know, there are people out there who have scary family histories who are BRCA negative. And back before we found BRCA2, all those people with BRCA2 were found to be BRCA negative because we only knew about what's now BRCA1. So things, as, as you mentioned, things keep continuing to get better and better and evolve and we keep learning more and more. But just because someone's BRCA1 and BRCA2 negative doesn't mean that we haven't found BRCA3, 4, or 5 yet, so. Okay, I'm going to let you, Gleaves, um, ask another question um, while I look through some more of the audience okay. questions. Oh, I've got one. <laughs> you know, we've heard a lot of debate around Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, and the three lines that always seem to converge in that debate are over access, quality, and cost. Could you please comment on what the trend lines in are for access, quality, and cost in, in this technology and in the availability? This meaning? Uh, for screening and uh, for breast cancer. So we, we have an inc breast cancer. incredible access problem across our country for minority and rural um, people. Uh, it's, it's, it's incredible and we just have to solve it, which is why, uh, you know, the Spectrum Health Cancer Center and the Betty Ford um, have 15 different sites and a mobile mammography unit um, trying to team up with community uh, support groups and other community groups to try to go into the communities to provide access to screening. Um, but it can't stop there. It has to, we have to get into the rural areas. Um, where people really don't have access to screening um, and, and provide that. So in terms of access, we have an incredible problem. In terms of quality, we have a quality differential based on tools and technology, whether you have access to, you know, 3D tomography and MRI. Um, so we definitely have to, to work on that as well in terms of, of technology. We also have um, quality differentials just based on a lot of other factors. So we're trying to, uh, you know, work across the entire region to try to really demonstrate in a transparent way quality of, of care, both in terms of diagnostic um, screening diagnosis, but also in terms of treatment. So making sure that the quality is high. But remember, plastic surgeons don't exist in, uh, you know, some of the midlands of North and South Dakota. So. There's, there's really, we really do have quite a way to come in terms of uh, quality and access to care. Um, fortunately, in Grand Rapids, there uh, is funding available um, through the Komen Foundation and the uh, National Breast Cancer Foundation. So in, anybody can get a mammogram. They can call and schedule, and if they don't have insurance when they get to that point of the, of the, the um, appointment questioning, things will be set up for them. Um, we use the mobile van to, to treat some underserved, to, to go out into underserved areas, so uh, two days a week it's at, at different, um, uh, basically, uh, community access um, facilities, uh, but there's a long way to go. And uh, we're fortunate in Grand Rapids that we have that. Um, there's a lot of parts of, of even the state of Michigan, let alone the rest of the country, that, that don't. So. You're mentioning cost and, uh, you know, the subsidies. What does uh, a good exam cost? Uh, hmm, boy, I'm the wrong with the answer. Um, There's it's, two, different, two it's, different parts of that. Okay. There's cost to the patient, mm -hmm. and there's cost to the system or the payer. And the cost to the patient is usually very low. Correct. I don't... Yeah, the cost, almost all screening uh, is uh, covered by, by most insurance companies uh, as long as you do it at the, at the routine intervals. Um, patients will sometimes be told, you know, you can't be covered for another two weeks, and, you know, because they're, they're not due yet. But um, so folks with insurance uh, are covered um, with the Affordable Care Act. There's more people able to get insurance. And uh, 
Uh, fortunately, for uh, for folks who don't have any insurance and are are not able to uh, to pay, there are funds available at at places places like this. But but again, we're very fortunate to have that. Thanks to thanks to our uh, uh, foundations. There's the other there's the other piece of this though, and that is the uh, the cost to the the individual. It's time off work and you know all of those types of things to get access to health care. So. We have a long way to go to address all of the components of the cost equation because it's not just the direct cost, it's also a lot of the other components that we have to deal with. Well, thanks for a very nuanced answer on that. It's, it's, that's helpful to understand. Do we have some more questions from the audience? I do. Um, can you speak to the current knowledge about associations between increased risk of breast cancer and diet and exercise? And you may want to talk about this either via increased risk or decreased risk as it applies to diet and exercise? <laughs> there, there are, um, we, we tend to have a higher uh, cancer incidence um, thought, thought to be due to, to Western lifestyle and so there are uh, dietary factors. Um, uh, smoking at one point uh, was was uh, and, and alcohol consumption have been looked at as as risk uh, factors as well. Um, the the biggest risk factor still is is family history. Um, but uh, if if people you know a lot of times they say well you know determine when you should have a mammogram based on your family history. If we only looked at people with positive family history of breast cancer, we'd be missing 75 percent of breast cancer. So. 75% uh, are not family related, they're, they're just sporadic breast cancers, so. Um. But cancer, cancer overall, um, if, if you look at your cancer risk, smoking, diet, and exercise all play a role, a causative role. A Western diet, high in fat, high in, in, red, um, in, in red meat, um, and low exercise clearly can increase your risk of certain types of cancers. Again, this is one of those things where we are unsure as to the exact kind of causal route to get there. So why? We know in colon, in colon cancer that if you have a diet that's low in vegetables and high in red meat, then you don't have solid stools and then you have the motility predisposes you to get polyps. Very straightforward answer on that one. But why, why would that have anything to do with pancreas cancer or breast cancer or any of the other cancers? Um, we also know that people that are um, obese have a poor outcome in some cancers. But what we don't know why is it because they're not exercising and therefore they're obese and they have a lousy diet? Or is it because then they just don't tolerate um, the therapy as well? So again, there's a lot of these things that that we read about, that we hear about, that we're still trying to figure out a physiologic or a biologic reason as to why these things may be true. Because there are some things that we read and that we study that are true, true, and unrelated. And we're just not sure in every cancer type which of these, except for smoking, is um, directly related to the outcomes. Okay, we surely have another question. I, I have one. Um, if you have, if your physician tells you that you have dense breast tissue and you could benefit from further screening beyond a mammography, what does that mean? Um, there's been a lot of debate about uh, breast, breast density recently and um, for anybody that wants to know uh, what their breast density is, every mammogram report has that uh, as, as part of it and mammogram reports can always be requested from your doctor and soon they'll be available on the MySpectrum uh, website just like lab values are. Um, for people with breast dense, uh, with dense breast, there's um, not universal agreement on what the, the best additional screening is. Um, whole breast ultrasound has been recommended, but whole breast ultrasound has a very high uh, false positive rate. So of things that we um, are worried about on mammography that go on to biopsy, about 20 to 25 percent of those turn out to be uh, breast cancer. On things that are found on ultrasound and biopsy, only about 10 percent turn out to be uh, cancer. So there are a lot more uh, biopsies done if we screen with ultrasound. So we tend to, uh, to try to stay away from that. Um, MRI is excellent, um, but 
it's something that a lot of insurance companies won't uh, cover uh, unless someone is, is fairly high risk. Uh, there are also risks to MRI, including risks of, of contrast allergy and, and things like that. So what we like, um, well, first of all, anybody with dense breasts should be sure that they're getting mammograms with full field digital mammography. And fortunately, most places in Grand Rapids now are using digital mammography. When we started doing digital mammography, we, we kept looking at films and going, boy, this patient's less, brents, less dense than last year. And, and pretty soon we realized, no, they're not. We're just seeing through that tissue a lot better. So full field digital has been great for, for dense breasts. Um, and for folks that do need additional screening because of uh, dense breasts, at this point we're recommending uh, uh, tomosynthesis or uh, DBT, digital breast tomosynthesis, which is 3D mammography because that gives us a 3D look at the breast where we're stepping through the breast tissue a slice at a time, just like a, a loaf of bread. And so something that's, that, that's over here isn't being hidden by dense tissue over here because we can look at each slice separately. So we've, we've found that tomosynthesis to be a, a great supplemental screening tool, um, much less expensive than MRI and, and uh, uh, helps us find a lot more. Um, we've been talking a lot about um, breast cancer in women. I think, you know, that's the, t the way we typically talk about it. But men get breast cancer also. Um, so there's a question from the audience about signs and risks um, for men's breast cancer. Can you speak to that? Uh, family, hist family history, redness of the breast, or a lump. That's it. Yep. Um, ten, tender um, lumpiness behind the nipple is usually a benign thing called gynecomastia. A breast cancer is typically not, not painful, but uh, not all cancers read the book. And so uh, some, some tender things do turn out to be breast cancer. So if someone has a discrete lump, it's definitely worth being, being tested. Um, there's no recommendation for, for routine screening for men. Uh, it's fortunately fairly common in men. but but we see cases of male breast cancer every year. I cannot tell you how happy I am to hear a doctor say that diseases do not read the books. <laughs> That's so frustrating. Um, here, here's one, I, I'm not sure, um, Gleaves, maybe uh, you would, would, could be able to speak to this. What, would, um, what might today be like if Betty had not been candid about her breast cancer and her substance abuse? Well, again, she used the platform of the White House, and it surprised her because Betty Ford had actually complained about having an esteem problem. I mean, she had served her family. She had served her husband in particular in his political career. And I wish, is Steve Ford present in the audience? Um, he could speak to this better than I. But, but in interviews, she said that she often felt that her capacities as a human were not developed, and she did not have a voice, and then all of a sudden, when her husband, by provisions of the 25th Amendment, gets the vice presidency and then the presidency, she all of a sudden has this voice. She's saying, wow. Uh, so when I'm speaking in recovery from my hospital bed, literally millions of women are listening to what I'm saying, and it is changing the lives of those women, and they're acting. You know, they're, they're leaving the kitchen or they're leaving the, you know, packing their children's lunches and they're going out and getting those exams. And she was shocked at what a great impact she could make. So right there, our hat's off to her. And this is why we, we wish her a, a great happy birthday today because a lot of women have said she, she saved women's lives by the millions. And I think that is significant. So she's saving families by the millions. Uh, it's just remarkable. Uh, one thing I also want to say is that, and maybe by way of conclusion, I don't know how much time we have left, but uh, in... We're probably getting close to a wrap-up. Well, I mentioned John and Abigail Adams earlier, and uh, the other reason I mentioned them, the Adamses, is that their daughter, Nabby, had breast cancer. And there's a very poignant scene, whether you're reading it, encountering it in David McCullough's book on... John Adams, which was a bestseller, or you watch the HBO series, and you watch that terrible scene. Uh, if, if you want to know what having breast cancer was like in the 1800s, and what a mastectomy involved, when Dr. Benjamin Rush is called in, it's truly chilling. It, 
it will get in your head and it will never leave. But you look at what the Adamses went through, what the Fords went through, the tremendous progress, and then again, the great leaps since Betty Ford opened her heart to us that our society has made. And it's really encouraging. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, it's now my pleasure to bring, to introduce uh, and welcome up to the stage Joe Calvaruzzo, who heads up the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, and he's going to speak to us a little bit. Joe? Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, many of you went, attended the luncheon today, and I think we had a real treat. Uh, Mrs. Carter, Steve walked uh, Mrs. Carter out to the, the car. Uh, she just absolutely adored Mrs. Ford, and she was so pleased to be here. The reception she received over at the uh, uh, JW Marriott, uh, it was just really heartwarming to see the sense of respect that Mrs. Carter and they developed over the years. And, you know, Mrs. Carter still championed the causes of mental health and Habitat for Humanity, a number of the Habitat for Humanity. People came out and attended the lunch today, and it's wonderful the relationship that we have with Spectrum Help to come out and talk about the issues, and I know Susan Ford's coming out for the race, and Spectrum's involved with the race later this year that's going to take place back here at the, in the park in the museum area. And I think even today we've got to champion these causes and bring them, bring them forth and be able to talk about them, and uh, I think it's great that Spectrum's here to help bring those issues to the table and talk about them. And Gleaves, thanks so much for uh, the Hauenstein Center for Presidential Studies at uh, Grand Valley State University. We have a great relationship with Grand Valley and glad you came in to over today to bring your insights. So I think, uh, please enjoy your day. Thank you for attending. Uh, thank you for helping pay tribute to uh, Mrs. Ford's 96th birthday today. So thank you for hosting Joe. And